the friends and colleagues bhai aur behno today is a is a very special webinar special among the 20 we have already organized and of course special among many more we plan organizing in the next two months this webinar is on gandhi and cities and the people who are conversing people who are talking are the people who have studied gandhi written on gandhi followed his teaching in their own work and life presented gandhi to people and tried to understand his message for themselves and the world in search of new ideas and alternative ways of doing things they have tried understanding his satya his dharma his ahimsa his humanity his compassion and his commitment to putting the last the first also on his love for villages on gram swaraj on decentralization on environment ecology and sustainability and of course on his value framework almost 50 years that one has been in this work i have neither heard experts or many professionals talk about gandhi and cities and i i have read very little of the subject we therefore very excited about this dialogue about this conversation we are grateful to gandhi ashram and gujarat vidyapeet for this collaborative venture in talking about gandhi and cities and i'm thankful to tridip surut saab anamik shah sir and of course the distinguished panel consisting of ilaben ram guha surita narayan and kartikeya sarabhai i'm going to take slightly longer today and in my introductory remarks i intend doing three things i intend presenting a global statement on cities and the urban challenge i plan sharing with you a civil society vision on asian cities and i also want to tell you briefly why we are doing this series of webinars as many as 30 that we are organizing let me come to the first statement that's about wally andau the secretary general of habitat 2 the 20 year global conference on human settlements that took place in istanbul in 1996 what he said was very interesting he said urbanization holds out both the bright promise of an unequal future and the grave threat of unparalleled disaster and what it will be depends on what we do today unless a revolution in urban problem solving takes place the future is not very bright he talked about early decisive action and a revolutionary approach to urban problem solving this were his prescription to avoid the unparalleled disaster the questions are is this urgency visible anywhere and the second question is is revolution in the problem in the urban problem solving in the making in any form the second statement which i am very proud about and and like sharing 
wherever I get opportunity, is on Canton Declaration. Close to 20 years ago, some 25 civil society activists, urban professionals, and community representative met in a town called Canton in Malaysia. They discussed future of Asian cities and produced what is called the Canton Declaration. That was on the vision of Asian cities. While on a webinar on Gandhi and city, I would like to present the seven principles, the vision statements that they proclaimed. They wanted the Asian cities to be one, economically productive, culturally vibrant, socially just, politically participatory, environmentally sustainable, technologically adaptive, and of course, people-centric. I was part of that meeting and contributed to that formulation. I'm really proud that the statement was authored by the civil society and was part of Asian People's Dialogue as the urban drama is at its peak and most dramatic in the Asian region. I've always seen this declaration as E is equal to MC square of the urban challenge. The third thing that I want to kind of point out today as I introduce this webinar is why are we doing this webinar series? And the question is, is the revolution in urban problem solving that Wally Andau talked about anywhere near? The answer is no, it's clearly no. Be that COVID-19, which is urban in its manifestation, or the climate change, which is knocking at the door, we know that urban matters, on urban matters, things are not in great shape. And it is not only the global big natural calamities and disasters, even conditions in our cities are worrisome, be that slums, homelessness, environmental degradation, polluted rivers, depleting water tables, exploitative working conditions of the labor, the city makers. And uh, if you tell us, all this tell us that we are not on the track, so far our planning, so far management, and so far our development of our cities are concerned and the manner in which we are channelizing our urbanization. Cities are diabolic. The engines of growth all right. 65 to 70% of the GDP is produced in cities, but they're also big polluters. We know that globally cities occupy just 2% of the land mass and they contribute, they, they consume 75% of the resources and they throw 75% of the waste in the environment. This must change. And this must change rapidly and this must change decisively. And that calls for rethink, that calls for doing things differently, that calls for new perspectives and new ways of doing things. And in our view, that government only rethinking re re about cities is not enough. World Bank telling us how to rethink cities is not enough. Our water boards telling us how to save water is not enough. We think it is a wider societal challenge that we must accept. Mm -hmm. And it is, in that direction 
that these 30 webinars are directed to. We are making an effort to take the urban challenge to the city hall. We are taking this urban challenge to the people. And we believe they have the ability, they have the wherewithal, they have the commitment, and they have resources to respond to this challenge. It is with this long introduction that I hand over today's webinar to 3D Saab to, to bring in this incredibly rich talent panel that we have to hear from them on Gandhi and cities. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kirti. Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, I don't want to take too much time, but just uh, as, as a way of framing some things, two, two things. Uh, for most people, the subject of Gandhi and the city or the urban would be a counterintuitive thing. Um, those of us who have read Gandhi's collected works know that the word urban is not even a subject indexed uh, in, in, in the 97 volumes of, of Gandhi's writings. Uh, all entries on the city are classified under uh, in their exploitative nature and the exploitative relationship that they have with the rural areas. So at one, at the first glance, it seems that um, it, is, it is not something, it would not be a productive or a useful conversation to have. Uh, and that's the impression that we've lived with vis-a-vis -vis Gandhi, vis-a-vis -vis what we've learned of Gandhi forgetting um, that Gandhi was a deeply urban person. Um, his preferred habitat were urban spaces for a very long part of his life. Um, he had an almost tender love for, for London, um, um, the kind of love that Jinnah had for Bombay, Gandhi had for London. Um, uh, his politics in South Africa and a large part of his politics in India was conducted through urban spaces, urban uh, modes of mobilization. Uh, his interventions in the industry came through urban centers like Ahmedabad. Also, um, the fates of at least two cities uh, in modern India were in fact shaped by Gandhi uh, soon there after the independence, Calcutta and Delhi, the way, the way they turned against themselves, if Gandhi had not intervened, uh, those two cities would have been very different, uh, perhaps more divided, perhaps more prone to violence than they are. Uh, so while it might seem counterintuitive to think of Gandhi uh, and the city, we have, I think, much to learn from the way he carried on his politics, the way he thought of institutional structures, uh, the way he uh, created his modes of intervention uh, in these uh, centers, uh, and the relationship that he sought to establish between the city and, and the rural, uh, both as people and as, as, as economies. Uh, I, uh, what I hope to do is that the four, 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 four people, Ila Ben, Ramchandra Guha, Sunita Narayan, and Kartike Sarabhai would take us through some of these aspects. Uh, we don't necessarily have to get bogged down with the historicity of Gandhi, but I'm sure Ram is going to foreground some of them, uh, also take us through what it would mean in terms of the politics that Gandhi unleashed for urban uh, areas. Uh, and Ila Ben and Kartike and Sunita would take us through other aspects. Uh, the order in which we would do that is uh, Ila Ben would go first, followed by Ramchandra Guha, then Sunita Narayan and Kartike Sarabhai. Uh, I am not going to intervene even to introduce them. They actually require no introduction. I know it's an Indian tradition to say that they require no introduction and then you give a long introduction. I am, um, I am going to deviate from it. So Ila Ben, uh, um, um, please go first and, and in that order. Uh, at the end of it, we would have time to take questions and even maybe further set of reflections from four of you uh, and if necessary from me. Thank you.
Eleven, you'll have to unmute yourself, please. Um, your mic is not on. We are unable to hear you in our Yes, now we're fine. Yes. Oh. Namaste, everybody. Welcome, everybody. Shall I say welcome to welcome to Gujarat Vidyapit, welcome to Ashram, welcome to Ahmedabad. Uh, uh, Kirti Bhai, Tame uh, Kamal Shri. It's a very important subject. Uh, but you know, let me start. You know what I think and what I have uh, I've experienced uh, in terms of uh, with related to Gandhi and also with related to city. Uh, you may agree with me or not, but still, may I be bold? Let me be bold uh, to say that there is no urgent need to rethink the city. I'm clear? Okay. Uh, but there is no urgent need to rethink, rethink the city. Not for that matter to rethink uh, Gandhi or his ideas. If think uh, then let us think of citizens in the city. And I find, <clears throat> I find in my work uh, in urban and rural both that uh, thinking of Gandhiji and about Gandhiji's thinking that we have today is good enough to help us plan better, plan better cities. The citizens as they are, make his ideas come alive. They themselves make them alive. However, I also find uh, that thinking about the city as it is, uh, that offers us a lot to do. Uh, my sense is that the need is rather not to rethink but to put uh, Gandhiji's thinking into action. So these urban and rural labels, I feel that they are misleading, dividing, and make uh, his ideas, uh, uh, you know, rather, I may say that uh, it's rather I mean, not to rethink, but to put Gandhi's thing into action and the urban and rural labors so being misleading and dividing uh, and often even not suitable, not suitable for the city. So this is what I, I want to say boldly. And uh, I really cannot agree uh, with, with this divide between uh, the rural and urban because in my work I've been facing this all the time. Uh, these boundaries, uh, village and city and rural labor and uh, urban worker. So that's why that this has been my, my thinking based on my experience. Okay, uh, but uh, in fact, when we think of the difference between city and, and the village, we see many commonalities, in fact. Commons between urban and rural are, are several, rather many. In fact, uh, uh, our cities are 
I may say that our cities are more uh, rural than urban. Uh, and since a, since a majority of city dwellers have migrated to these cities in past uh, so many years, I don't know, but uh, for, a, for a long time, from villages. We all have come from villages. So the city structure, layout, the city services are often fashioned on the rural pattern. I can, I do see that also. What is not are the marvels of architecture and uh, urban design. They stand out. Uh, so let me suggest where we can think, where we have scope to think more. And I think it will be useful in coming years for Gandhian thinking as well as urban, urban thinking. Let us take the idea of trusteeship. Trusteeship, you know, having my background in a TLA and with Ansoyabin, uh, it was Ansoyabin, I mean Motabin, who herself consciously practiced it. Consciously, unconsciously, she practiced the principle, we call it principle now, of trusteeship. She had money, she had education, she had exposure and empathy. She saw the condition of the poor male workers who made Ahmedabad prosperous, industrial peace. She realized that needed, uh, that the labor who needed higher wages, they needed uh, organizing, more access to social protection and proper housing and better treatment by the meal owners. She put her mind, money and efforts in, in their services. She became the custodian of what she had. And see, we have, and uh, we, we have India's, I don't know whether to use had or have, uh, uh, India's first innovative and mighty trade union of mill workers that shaped industrial peace and workers' prosperity for, for so many decades. Seva was born in TNA. Uh, Seva the organized workers in the informal economy and uh, gave them an identity to the union. Uh, they were brought into the mainstream of the economy very gradually with a lot of struggle. So Seva was able to, what I mean to say is that Seva was able to imbibe these ideas to the collective benefit of their members, poor women, uh, working. For instance, Seva members, uh, if Seva member organized, if I light karne, Rameshwar, Rameshwar, light karne. Light. Uh, you know, we, we unionized, uh, even, is it okay? Uh, uh, we unionized, even though they were being in the so called informal economy, they were invisible, voiceless. There, there was no validity of their work. 
but uh, they, you know, they could unionize, organize, and uh, uh, then build up a, a cooperative bank, a cooperative social security structure. So, and that has benefited uh, all of them and the city. What I mean to say is that Gandhi is there, Gandhi was there. Uh, let us think more about vendors, my favorites. The natural market that springs up in any area is at a 15 minutes walk away from the residents. Even today, even the municipal corporation makes them leave uh, ruthlessly. But even then, this 15 minutes walk away you know, markets do happen today and they work out. They do the necessary services. So we need to think why we have yet not found a way to incorporate this count of citizens in our city plan, in our city market. They are citizens as well, but not yet fully. We can think more on why artisans and gramodyoks are considered rural and unindustrial. In fact, handicraft indeed is urban also and far more industrious than a corporate industry. So what is the role of urban artisans? Urban handicrafts. Why on peace rate payment only? Why not through workers' cooperatives instead of through contractors and subcontractors in city planning? We need to think more about women's leadership. Women's leadership in city planning, management, and protection. More women city mayors and, uh, and many more corporators. But of course, only empty tokenisms of appointing women leaders is not enough. Women also, uh, on, the, the, on the women's side, let me say that women also need to be more serious about their own self. We need to incorporate more feminine perspectives in planning and running of cities. Basically, naturally, women are natural homemakers. After all, we can think uh, importantly uh, as our goals about building an economy of nurturance. The economy of nurturance for urban areas and citizens that we are talking about today. Cities in their current avatar are often getting more wild, more, more extractive and feral entities and that suck in normal, human, natural, and all other resources. All resources, all kinds of resources. The wealth they produce is solely based on transforming of natural and human capital into financial capital. As such, the wealth produced by cities uh, such on on uh, such as on this uh, you know this development trajectory is decreasing day by day and becoming unsuitable. How can cities become centers of building the urban economy of nurturance? That is the question. Economy of not self-destruction. 
but of nurturance. Slums are an integral part of our cities. We are so ashamed of them. Why? <clears throat> In fact, uh, they are the solutions that citizens who have been forsaken by the authorities and governments have found for themselves. It's a solution. Uh, it is a form of self-rule. And we must aspire to improve the situation of these slums. What we must improve is their income, their access to basic services, and their livelihoods, their jobs, their economic status, informal sector. Informal sector workers in cities are also a Ghanaian solution. Let me say that. We want to formalize them. But why? Let them do what they can do. What they need, like any other citizen, is social protection and fair, fair wages, fair basic income. They need access to their own natural legal markets. Here lies the practice of trusteeship. The, the haves taking social responsibility of the have-nots of the city. Our haves, our haves of, uh, of our cities can take up responsibility of the have-nots of uh, their own city. I find that most of what Gandhiji said was for citizens, for a citizen, not a city or a village. It is possible for citizens to follow these ideas, his ideas in both rural as well as urban context. So, Uh, uh, sorry. So how can we rethink cities when we have not done the thinking about them? in the first place. We have not thought about, about the large majority of, uh, of citizens who have come from, from rural areas. Uh, while, uh, while rethinking, I cannot, uh, I cannot agree with this divide, as I say, I would say that why can't the city has the same fresh air, green trees in the cities, same drinking fresh water, waste being recycled locally, nutritive food fresh, maintaining neighborhoods, maintaining you know relationships, and build into communities. Crafts, uh, simplicity, and then the Gandhi will be there. That is there. Uh, so, can we rethink cities when we have not done the thinking about them in the first place? So, let us think. Think for ourselves. Think of what Gandhi just said. Uh, and not what others have said, what others have written about Gandhiji's ideas. Let us think about the cities we live in and want to live in. And let citizens lead our thinking and rethinking or 
I must say, really thinking on cities instead of relying solely on uh, architects and city planners and builders and urban authorities and scholars. Thinking on our own is a prerequisite to any rethinking. And here I would conclude. Namaste. Thank you, Ila Ben. Um, Ram, yours. Ah, uh, thank you, thank you, Tidip, and thank you, <coughs> Kriti Bhai, for uh, inviting me to this webinar. Gandhi famously said, "India lives in her villages." Now, this claim was absolutely false in a historical sense, uh, because India has also always lived in her cities from the fabled cities of Hastinapura, Indraprastha, Ayodhya, uh, to Banaras, which claims to be the oldest living, uh, continuously living city in the world, a claim I believe Damascus, among other places, would vigorously dispute, possibly Rome too, but still, uh, you know, 2,000 years of urban, uh, continuous urban civilization in Banaras. Uh, you have the great medieval cities like Delhi, Agra. In South India, you have a, an empire called Vijayanagara, you know, uh, uh, the triumph of, of the city. So Gandhi's claim was false historically, but that should not concern us because Gandhi was not a historian. He was making a metaphorical argument. But it was also false when judged against the context of his own life. And as Tidhi pointed out in his introductory remarks, uh, Gandhi was shaped and made by cities. Now, this is not reflected in the collected works, as uh, Tidhi said, in the index urban does not appear, and cities appear generally in an exploitative sense. Uh, there's a famous line of uh, Gandhi's, uh, which I think comes from the early 1930s, where he said, the blood of the villages is the edifice on which cities are built. So, you know, uh, and that's, this is the statement which um, uh, sort of resonated with what Kriti Bhai said in his introductory remarks. He said cities are diabolical in the way they exploit resources from the countryside. They suck in all the resources from the countryside. And that's absolutely true. I'm speaking to you from Bengaluru. Uh, 50 years ago, Bengaluru got its water from a lake outside called Hesargatta and a small reservoir called Tipigandahalli. Then it moved to the Kaveri, which is some 60 miles away. And now it wants to go to the Sharavati, which is 700 miles away. So, at one level, that statement is true. But cities can also be emancipatory. When Baba Sahib Ambedkar, Gandhi's great contemporary and occasional, or more than occasional rival, famously said in the Constituent Assembly debates that the village republic is a den of iniquity. And the love of the Indian intellectual for the village is pathetic. I think he said infinite right is pathetic. Because cities can also be emancipatory. For Dalits, for example, Cities are an escape from the stigmatization of the village. They are not marked by caste, by locality, and so on. And by the way, this is the point I want to make, cities were emancipatory for Gandhi as well. We would not have the Gandhi we have had he not gone to London. What did London do to him? London opened his mind. You met new kinds of people. He, at a philosophical level, he developed a deep ethical understanding of vegetarianism and non-violence through his membership of the vegetarian society. He befriended citizens, uh, Christians, English people. Uh, he lived uh, with a white man of a different religion, Josiah Oldfield, in several different places, which he could not have done in Rajkot or Porbandar or Mumbai. He comes back to Mumbai and uh, he starts his law practice and fails. Now, this is a question uh, I often ask. What if Gandhi had succeeded at the Bombay Bar? He would be a parochial Gujarati Baniya. 80% of his clients would have been Gujarati Baniyas. He would have lived in an enclave of Gujarati Baniyas. He would have only spoke Gujarati. And that's, that means that he would have been a parochial person. So I often tell this to students that failure can be emancipatory. What if Gandhi had succeeded? You and I would not be talking. Gandhi failed. So whenever I walk past that magnificent high court building in um, you know, near the Maidan in Gothic Mumbai, I offer a prayer for Gandhi's failure uh, because uh, without that, there would be no India and there would be no activists like Ila Ben uh, and there would be no scholars like Tidip Suruz or me either, who have spent their whole life you know, scratching away at Gandhi. So, 
failure and because you know retreated to parochialism it's very common by the way all of us have no people of that generation who went abroad to study you know i'm a tamil so you have tamils who go back to study come back rasam sadam carnatic music meeting only members of their own caste and that's it so gandhi would have retreated to a parochial gujarati maniya ghetto had he not failed and is secured from obscurity by this invitation of south africa which is from a gujarati but a muslim significantly a muslim and just as he shares a home uh, with josiah oldfield in london he gets off the ship in durban and goes to dada abdullah's house this is inconceivable you can't hindus and muslims can't be sleeping under the same roof uh, you know in any city in gujarat and they probably even in gujarat today they don't do it right so then he is in durban and then he goes to johannesburg uh, as is well known his first funder is a parsi parsi rustam thi uh he understands the diversity of india only in the diaspora in durban and johannesburg in particular uh that that he understands that india is a land of many languages which is why indian opinion is printed in four languages tamil among them and has been documented by many historians tamils were the most steadfast and militant and brave among his uh followers in the satyagraha movement and among the most steadfast and brave gujarati followers were not necessarily hindus but muslims like achalya uh, you know who who in uh, who almost saved the satyagraha when it was failing and whose descendants by the way as a interesting historical tidbit achalya's descendants played a very important role in the struggle against apartheid under the leadership of the african national congress so cities emancipated gandhi uh, you know uh, he expanded his ideas made him uh, a universal being not just a parochial indian defined by his language his caste his locality now as then the other historical significance of course is what gandhi, so this is what cities gave to gandhi cities emancipated gandhi from his parochialism uh, in a cultural ethical linguistic religious moral sense what did gandhi give back to cities tilip has alluded to this he gave back a great deal uh, his first satyagraha was in cities the idea of the satyagraha was invented uh, on 11 september 1906 in the empire theater in johannesburg it was first enacted uh, on a limited scale in ahmedabad because the champaran satyagraha was not really a satyagraha per se you know he went and protested he was briefly detained and he mobilized support but there was no dharna or protest in the way there was in ahmedabad uh, in 1918 Uh, among whose prime movers were Gandhi and Ilaben's mentor Anu Anusuya Bhan Sarabhai. Then his first major mass satyagraha was in Bombay in 1919 against the Roll Attack. So the idea of satyagraha was created, thought, refined, articulated um, in cities. Later to be taken all over the countryside. You know, as in the Salt March, and of course in many popular movements in Bardoli and many parts of India, in Patapgarh, in UP, and all across. Right? So. gand and then of course finally uh the epic fast that he did mentioned uh, after partition in delhi and calcutta so cities emancipated gandhi gandhi also in a certain sense emancipated the city so the cities were the laboratory the vehicle the site of some of the most innovative ideas of gandhi even against um, untouchability i mean the pune the fast in pune in yarawada jail are were also conducted in cities not really uh in a rural ashram so having said that as a historian that cities made gandhi gandhi in turn gave a great deal back to cities what relevance this is where i'll conclude in last uh, for in, in the concluding part of my presentation what relevance to gandhi's ideas have for making cities more habitable today it is introductory remarks kirti bai spoke with with a great deal of depth and insight and poignancy about the environmental degradation of the cities of the lack of proper habitation or of you know civic strife what can gandhi's ideas give us uh, in making our cities more habitable today now of course they've already given us quite a lot uh, you know clearly his general ideas of pluralism tolerance unto there unto this last uh, you know listening to ila ben speak uh she and seva are and of course anusuya ben and are, are kind of exemplary uh models of applying gandhi's ethical and social ideas to city life 
in a broad sense. Another great example, and this is it stuck me, very little known in India, though Ila Ben and Tridip and Kartikeya and Sunita might know, but maybe the wider audience will not know, is a remarkable um, Pakistani called Akhtar Hamid Khan, who is extraordinary life. I would love to have a biography of Akhtar Hamid Khan, and for those uh, young uh, or no, maybe not so young people around who don't know about him, Akhtar Hamid Khan uh, taught at Jamia Milia. He was there in 47, 48 during Gandhi's last period in Delhi. He then moved, he was in the Indian civil service. He left that, he moved to East Pakistan. He founded the Bangladesh Institute of Rural, or the East Pakistan Institute of Rural Development. Then he went to Karachi, where he did extraordinary work in urban planning, the Orangi project, which is a pioneering uh, kind of example of low cost housing, safe water and education for one of the, one of the world's largest slums was done by a man inspired by Gandhi very Khadi. So he took Gandhi's best ideas to the cities. But apart from the broader philosophy of Gandhi, uh, in a practical urban environmental sense, I believe that we shouldn't look to Gandhi for answers. So there's a tendency uh, you know, among a certain kind of Gandhian to think that you don't have to go beyond Gandhi. There's everything in the collected works of my life is my message. But I don't think that's true at all. And I want to say in what, uh, uh, the last thing I want to say is that there's the idea, there are the ideas of one other person born on the same day as Gandhi, which need to be revived and rehabilitated. A historical figure whose ideas need to be revived and rehabilitated, rehabilitated to tackle and overcome the kinds of challenge that, challenges that India, Indian cities face today. When Gandhi was alive, Lots of Indians lived in cities. Now many more do. I mean, Kartikeya will know the exact figures, but there must be close to 400 million people who live in cities. Now, at the person whose ideas apply, I think, in a very direct sense, uh, is a man called Patrick Geddes, who was born on 2nd October 1854, the same day as Gandhi. Uh, somewhere, somewhere some, perhaps in Scotland, his native Scotland, there's a seminar going on, a webinar going on him as we speak. He spent many years working in India. He met Gandhi, he worked with Tagore, and his ideas, which I have written about in a recent essay in the journal India Forum, on, are I think extremely relevant for making Indian cities habitable. He spoke about respect for heritage, respect for nature, respect for democracy, and much of what he, and he studied many cities. You know, he, studied, he wrote about Thane, about Balrampur, about, about Lahore, about Patiala, and he also wrote about the city of Amdava. Uh, there's a lovely book uh, that is in press, which Sidhip knows about, by Robert Stevens, Ahmedabad Walls, a circumambulation with Patrick Geddes, with photographs by Pranlal Patel, who was an Ahmedabad-based photographer of the first half of the uh, 20th century, and Tina Nandi, who's a Mumbai photographer. And I would urge all of you who want to take Gandhian ideals to city, broadly, broadly Gandhi, Gandhian ideals to city planning, to look to Geddes directly rather than to Gandhi himself. Thank you. Thank you, Ram. Thank you very much. And I'm grateful that you invoked Patrick Geddes. Uh, Sunita, please. Thank you, Tridip. And uh, thank you, Ram. Fascinating and always mesmerizing when you speak and with so much knowledge. Uh, thank you, Kirti Bhai, for asking me to do this today. I'm, I'm really privileged. Uh, I haven't seen also Kartike and Ila Ben for so long that it's nice to see them at least long distance. So thank you. So I, um, I'm going to take off from where I'm uh, left. And for me, obviously, as an environmentalist, the issue is to look at Gandhi and the city, your topic. Now, um, it's been well said that Gandhi really, the vis Gandhi's vision of a city um, is not clear. We talk about Gram Swaraj, but he never presented to us what would be in his um, idea uh, a, a city. Um, but I think, and I slightly disagree with uh, Ram and uh, Ilaven, or not really disagree, it's a matter of perspective, I think modern cities in India desperately need Gandhi's wisdom today. Um, as Kirti said very clearly, we are lost in 
you know, our garbage. We're literally drowning in garbage and the spit of our cars. Uh, it's becoming difficult to breathe today in our cities. But why? But what we need to understand is that this is happening because we have chosen a model of urbanization that is both resource and capital intensive. It uses vast amount of resources, land, water, forests. It discharges massive amounts of waste. Now, this is a resource model that has been, has grown out of the uh, cities of the world. But the fact is, it is very expensive. And so it can be afforded by some and not by the rest. And this is where, in some senses, if you think about it, one of Gandhi's quote, which is very misquoted, and I know when I say it, uh, Ram will correct me, and rightly so, um, is a quote where in Hind Swaraj, when he's asked about um, what would his vision of India be, and would he like it to be another Britain? And he talks about the fact that it took Britain the rape of half the world to be what it is, how many worlds would India need? And I know I have not uh, said it the way he wrote it, but that's the essence of it. And the fact is that today gets translated into the model of urbanization that is in our cities. And it would work if we had the amount of capital it needs to be able to provide for all and not for some. And that really is the nub of the environmental problem today in our cities. Take air pollution. We talk about air pollution, but what we don't often talk about is the fact that only a minuscule number of people in our cities actually drive cars. Less than 10% in Delhi and in most Indian cities, even less. But cars occupy 90% of the road space. In my city of Delhi, 26% of Delhi is today under roads and flyovers. And as we build more, we get more congestion and more pollution. We've taken away the right to walk, even the right to cross a road safely, and we cannot breathe. And the question that we have to ask, and that's really the question where the cities have to start asking the fundamental Gandhi question, where, when you take the issue of air pollution, where is the space for the remaining 90% of the people? Where is the road space? Where is the air shared space? And that's where you start talking about how do you plan for all so that you can make sure that we have sustainability for all. And I will give you another example of water pollution. Our rivers are dead. In fact, I would say we are a generation of where we have lost something which is so fundamental. We have lost rivers. Again, in Delhi, we have something called the Sahibi River. Uh, it was called the Sahibi River. It's today the Najafkar Nala. It's the most polluted drain of Delhi. Mithi, which was a fresh water river in Mumbai, is today officially called a Nala, a drain. Buddha Nala in Ludhiana. And I can give you countless such examples. But again, the fact is you cannot clean your cities without understanding the inequity in the shit flow of our cities. CSE does what we call shit flow diagrams. And we've done this city after city after city. And it's fascinating because what these diagrams actually show you is that the vast number of people in our cities depend on what you would call an on-site system. A septic tank of the past, maybe well built well, but today just a tank connected to a drain. And this drain which is today unofficial sewage, then goes in to pollute our rivers. And that is really where we have to again go back to understanding that you cannot have, you cannot clean your rivers unless you have an affordable sewage management system and sanitation system for all. And yet the flush system based underground sewerage network that we have built in our cities is so capital intensive, so resource intensive, 
that we can meet the needs of some and not of all. So, and I can go on and on. I mean, on every environmental challenge that we have. But the bottom line is that we have no dream, no vision of what a modern Indian city should look like. There is really no Gandhi to turn to, to ask what that city will be that is inclusive and yet livable. And frankly, I don't know of any other, uh, um, um, I, I mean, I do a lot of work on environment, perhaps not on cities per se, but I don't know of this challenge of building for all, which is affordable for all and yet sustainable is something that any city in the world has actually worked on. Because cities have come at the end of massive amount of capital, of resources that they had. If you look at London, you look at New York, you look at any other city in the world, Today, when I ask my friends, would you in London be able to recreate the underground sewerage network at today's, and they say, no, it's not possible. And yet there is a water-based system that exists in London because the city could afford it when it was building. We can't do so today. So we have this extraordinary challenge of in some senses going back and understanding what this livability would mean in our cities when we have such gross and cross inequities. And this becomes even more important when you look at COVID-19. I mean, you cannot talk about the new remote. We are all very sort of exercised about the new normal, which is going to come where we are all remotely working. But all this is going to create a city that is even more deeply divided. I mean, we talk about the digital divide. We need to talk about the living divide. I mean, how many people are actually fortunate enough to live in cities which have in homes where they can do remote work and, 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 and still operate? And these are questions that we need to put back when we talk about the city of today and the city of tomorrow. And so in my view, the answers that I would take from Gandhi and the city would lie in first reclaiming the public because at the end of the day, it's the public space, it's the public institution that we need to think about, which we have forgotten for too long. We need to rethink the design so that it is first designed for the poorest so that it can be sustainable for all. I mean, today when I, I do a lot of work on air pollution and I'm very clear that if we want an answer to air pollution, we have to reinvent mobility. But to reinvent mobility in the context of our cities would mean that you need a public transport system which is modern enough for the rich and yet affordable enough for the poor. And remember, the poor today in our cities cannot even afford a bus they have to cycle, not because it's such a lovely elitist concept that we'd like to cycle in our cities because they have no choice. So this is really where what Ila Ben said is what needs to also come back because what we are finding when we look at the city and the answer, you need to take into account the informal today because these informal systems are actually the systems that keep the city going. Today, if I look at plastic, something that we work a lot on, and uh, everyone is very concerned about plastic, yet all over the world, we have been sold this very benign word, recycling. What does recycling mean? It recycling means today in our cities that the poor who, who can actually, for whom it is labor and employment, they collect it and they recycle it. If you go to the recycling factories, as I have done, you will understand what the pain of that recycling actually means. Right. But this really then means, but this is the only way that we'll ever be able to recycle. I mean, today the rest of the world is drowning in its garbage because it cannot find affordable cost systems to manage its waste. So we have the option of using the fecal sludge collector, the paratransit systems in our cities, the waste management cities uh, uh, systems, 
which are operated by the informal, not to think of formalizing them, but to think of integrating them and making sure that they have the, the wherewithal, the, the, the payments that will make their business both uh, clean and safe and humane. And, and this is where I'll end by saying one of the biggest things that has come out with COVID and that really has thrown the city in our face has been what we've seen in the migrant crisis or the worker crisis. I hate the word migrant workers. The exodus of the workers from our cities when the invisible became visible. And that's where we need to come back to understand why is this happening? When I go to the parts of Delhi where these workers work today in the factories, which I know are extremely polluting, part of the challenge of the pollution challenge we have, it's because we have got a system of growth in which we discount the cost of labor and the uh, cost of environment, which is why all businesses move from the West to China, where these costs were discounted. And when there is uh, regulation in India, those businesses move to the illegal, where those costs are discounted and labor and environment pays the price. Okay. In COVID, the question that came out when you saw the migrant crisis is that this needs to be valued. And this means that if you start paying the price of environment, if you start paying the price of labor, the cost of production will go up. And if the cost of production goes up, maybe we will start talking seriously once about the concept of frugality, not meaning poverty. And that's really where Gandhi's most important message in my view is in today's context of our cities, of our production and consumption systems, which make our cities uh, not, not just the drivers of growth, but also uh, the, 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 the places where you have maximum inequity and maximum um, uh, environmental degradation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sunita. Kartike Bhai, over to you. Thank you, Tridip, and thank you, Kirti, for organizing this um, whole series. And it's wonderful to be on this uh, panel with uh, Ila Ben, Ram, and Smita. And uh, let me share my little two bits. Um, like uh, Sunita said, it's not so much what Gandhi said about cities, but the relevance of Gandhi to making our cities sustainable in, in today's context. Most of what Gandhiji spoke about for settlements are really to do with villages and talking about the ideal village, one in which it's largely self-sufficient, it's for its essential needs, independent on the outside only for some uh, transactions. He saw a village unit meeting most of its food, clothing, livelihood, education. He even talks about recreation and playgrounds for children, worship and settlements of disputes. He saw these units as maintaining their own law and order. He's talking about volunteers and others. The community could also look at and afford their own waterworks and sanitation, of course, was his core concern. So I said that suppose we were to look at, replace the word village with an urban neighborhood or a ward. Suppose we were to see uh, a city, not in terms of this big agglomerate, but where there is more control and participation at the, at the ward level. And at the ward level, you have the type of uh, approach which Gandhi really took to, uh, to community sense of ownership, control, and responsibility. In, in fact, if you go to old Ahmedabad, the poles were somewhat like that. You had a street within the larger city which, which had its own norms and it had its own governance structure and could maintain a certain, certain standard. But today it has become uh, really a Sarkari city in, in some ways where where everything outside your home is not seen with the same sense of belonging or ownership. And that model really started with, to my mind, Western influence, which said that you need a central business district, you need to move people out into zoning, you have to have a commercial zone, and then you have to have a residential zone, and then you have an industrial zone. When people used to be able to live near their places of work, this was denied. This was seen as something which was old fashioned, 
and you needed to set them apart. As a result, everyone needed to move around. Everyone needed mobility, whether they use cars or they use cycles or, or they use public transport. But that, that need for moving around increased, increased many, many fold. And, and in that, uh, it would have been impossible for the cities to even survive. But for, as Ilaben was saying, the informal sector really coming in and providing so many services within, as she mentioned, for 15 minute walk. And that was considered outside the system. The informal sector is even today, uh, in spite of a few battles which have been won, considered something which is outside it. The, one of the first questions I was asking in the Smart Cities Forum was, uh, what is the role of the informal uh, sector in the smart cities? And there was very, very little answer because this was seen as something which was, which was not part. And it's the integral thing which has actually helped the city and how we make it together. The, the COVID pandemic, just by just decreasing even somewhat the human activity, especially mobility and others, has shown the dramatic effect on the environment. Uh, air pollution, for instance, many northern cities, we saw those photographs of people in Jalandhar walking up on their roof and suddenly seeing the Himalayan skyline and which they had never seen in this generation. So, so even with, with somewhat decreased level of activity, you are seeing this. But, but what we must realize that Gandhi's dream is easier to reach in this digital age. We are able to meet today. It's not as good as um, being at Sudita's place and having dinner after the meeting. But at the same time, we are able to do this. We are able to cut down on traffic tremendously. And if services are also provided at the neighborhood level, we could in fact, uh, in fact reach that situation where you have neighborhoods which, which, which to some extent behave like, like a village. In fact, I remember as a student that if I wanted to check up on anything, I would have to find the library, go into the library, search for books. Last night, I was watching a particular uh, quote on Gandhi. I could, from my phone, go to the collected works of Mahatma Gandhi through the wonderful Gandhi Heritage Portal, which the Sabarmati Ashram has, has, is managing, and, and find it with, with relative, relative ease. So, so the question of um, the local community, to some extent, being the trustee of that area. And I think Eleven started by talking about trusteeship. And I think trusteeship is one of the key cornerstone uh, um, uh, principles of Gandhi or, or messages of Gandhi, which we need to bring. And I, we are not, I'm here not talking about trusteeship being only of the rich or only of the elite. I'm talking about a person who might just be looking after a tree outside their house. A person who, a community which says, we will see that this environment is clean that they feel a certain sense of ownership. I have seen, for instance, in times when people have criticized that how dirty your city is, you can go into a house and they keep it immensely clean. But the minute they see the line, which is from their house to outside, they will just throw garbage just outside. Even in the poles, and Kirti and I were working in those areas, people would clean their house very meticulously and they would have no problem just in that Lakshman they are just throwing it outside. And, and I think that was again to do with this concept of ownership. So I would say that trusteeship and ownership, a sense of ownership, sense of belonging go together. And I think that is something which we have to bring back into, into the city. We ourselves have done several experiments of that. We, 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 we uh, took a municipal plot and uh, uh, re, re uh, greened it uh, after 18 years, gave it back. Today, it's managed by the community around it. Uh, people, people say that this is this is theirs. In Pune, for instance, one of our experiments has been for for local communities to do participatory budgeting. That how is the municipal money or the budget being used in their area, and can they set the priorities, or are priorities only set by by others? So what uh, Gandhi said. This is in 1935. What I would personally prefer would be not a centralization of power in the hands of the state, but an extension of the sense of trusteeship. As in my opinion, the violence of private ownership is less injurious than the violence of the state. I would support a minimum of state ownership. So one of the things which has happened in the city is, is this total usurping of everything outside in the city, which is why when people get angry, 
they will they will break a light pole even outside their house because they don't see it as their own in fact it was nice in navnirman days when they broke all the windows everywhere else near the university at the community science center they didn't touch it and when we asked them why not they said ne ye to a to apnu che this is ours and that sense of belonging was was critical at the foundation's uh, stone lake ceremony of the mj library in amdabad gandhi ji said i wanted amdabad to be a beautiful city but beautiful in my own sense of the word of course it should have gardens and scenic beauty but i expected to have inner beauty as well if anything is bad here we are to blame for it we have made amdabad dirty yet on this this day i cannot certify that amdabad is a clean city there is no fragrance the whole city stinks the neighborhood could be clean if we could again rally men and women volunteers to do it sardar patel at the time was the head of the municipality and at that time he is talking about public participation in in cleaning up cleaning up the city it is not recognized that a municipality does not deserve to exist this is gandhi where streets and lanes are not scrupulously clean all hours of the day and night to think of all the municipalities in the aggregate and to wait for other people to begin is 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 to postpone the problem those who will an ability to commence reform do it now again he is talking about don't wait for the ultimate solution start where you can today 87 years after that stink comment of gandhi ji when we started when kirti and i started work in the 70s and we were running the amdavad magazine the hill on which we worked thaltesh shekra was in fact the tallest hill in amdavad and we used to work there today it is no longer so the pirana hill of waste is taller and from a distance actually looks like a like a nice hill station so we are no longer even even that even that hill is not sacrosanct gandhi wrote to um, dr hari prasad uh, who had done a seven month long campaign in amdavad for cleaning it and he writes that those who do not know how to serve their own city can ne never serve their country the efforts to keep the city clean is an example of cooperation between municipality and the city he has several places talked about citizens involvement with the municipality as being critical uh, to doing uh, this thing it is possible to raise the necessary funds to make amdavad the model of cleanliness the money given for this work will bring handsome returns to the city and will open grounds and trees the health of the citizen will improve but then gandhi realizes as a good banya as rab would say he realizes that he should put one more line he puts in and the price of the land will also appreciate so so he he, he of course calls on the altruistic uh, nature of everyone but he says by the way by the way please do it but the price of land will will also go up hence the money given for this work will not be a gift but will an insistence on economic foresight it is interesting how gandhi ji well understood the man of when the wealthy when he said this um unfortunately waste is not the only stink in our cities waste is one obvious thing but it's not the only thing we have a long way to go in removing poverty and unemployment giving dignity to all our citizens including very importantly the informal sector the rag pickers are a key to making it possible to take the city towards the circular economy we continuously have seminars and talk about it but still don't give the rag pickers uh, the type of uh, status they need um they remain on the fringe of the city's decision making and policy despite the important role they play and the problem of prejudice goes for caste and religion and is deeply ingrained you know i have always been like kirti a proud amdavadi we love our city we love our country and everything else but we also love our city and one of the times i remember when i had to really look down and feel completely ashamed was when a program officer at the ce a senior program officer somewhat after the hindu muslim riots came and said she she was a hindu married to a muslim she said i cannot get a single place on rent to live in this city of yours she said i cannot get a place to live and it was so shameful i did my own thing i am i am not nobody in amdavad i i know people i can do things i thought but this one i couldn't fix i could not fix this 
and and it, it brought home to me what gandhi ji when he says your city stinks what does he mean it is not just garbage it's not just garbage which stinks we this is so many years later so many years later and we have not been able to get this out um, for me any number of such stories there any number of dalit stories you know ram you was you was talking about how a city would also emancipate in fact i was arguing with kinnari at sabarmati ashram uh, two days ago i said kinnari when you come from in a village however idealistic gandhi might have seen it a dalit is always a dalit and you have all your baggage with you but when you come to the city you can be yourself and the city can emancipate you from that baggage and and kinnari said kathi i will beg to defer just go with that name just go with the dalit name and try and find housing outside outside a ghetto area or go with a muslim name and try and find a housing and you will not be so if you think this india a city in this india uh, with with your proper name frees you unfortunately it doesn't even in 2020 it doesn't writing to hari prasad again in november 44 from sevagram Gandhi ji writes. Uh, Hari Prasad had gone to Sevagram to meet Gandhi and gave him all the Ahmedabad gossip. I shall be satisfied only if Ahmedabad helps me realize my dream. He says, "That is, if untouchability goes, root and branch, men and women attain equality. The inequality between the rich and the laborer is removed. Drink and gambling are stopped. Ideal cleanliness of the heart, as well as in the outer life, is observed, and no one suffers hunger." do whatever you can to do this and persuade others this is what he tells hari prasad when he sees him in sevagram gandhi's key concept of decentralization trusteeship participation importance of sanitation non discrimination non violence are all critical kirti to to building the city which we want to that ideal city and for amdabad just like ila ben told us that story there was an additional plus point through the majur majan sang he taught us how the peaceful settlement of disputes in this particular case it was between workers and mill owners in those days but how you can settle disputes between different interest groups through dialogue and through creating institutions which today seva exemplifies so well how you can do this so in sunita when she said do we have a vision and can gandhi help us with that vision i think he can and is extremely relevant to do that thank you very much thank you and um, thank you very much uh, all of you um while um you know while you were talking i've um, seen there about 58 comments and questions which have come uh, and what i would like to do is that uh, while you go in the second um uh, set of uh, remarks that you make uh, broadly i would try and prompt you to look at some of those things so ila ben um uh, if if we could request you to come back and speak for maybe about 3 to 4 minutes but the questions for you largely are about the nature of the informal economy and what place do you think they would have in the world going forward how is it that we are likely to be able to resolve the inequity and violence that informal economy brings to those who participate in it so um so ila ben if if you could think about i mean tell us about that and also share uh, very very briefly about um that very beautiful thing that you wrote called anubandh uh, uh, and that's something that has not come up but uh, that has deep relevance to what you've said and what the others have said Ila Ben, you will have to unmute yourself, please. Thank you. It is a false divide, formal and informal. Work, all types of shram is work, whether paid or unpaid. somehow maybe because of the industrialization 
etc you know that uh, word got a, a definition and which is so narrow and and because of i think mass production the method of mass production and uh, to going to the market and make profit and make the uh, the product uh, cheap, cheaper but that is because of of centralizing and all that so you know better than myself but i don't believe in these different kinds of device all work is work, work whether paid or unpaid in india 97% officially 95 but 97% of the workforce is uh, still informal they uh, they are not uh, you know protected under under any law but yes now yes with uh, with a few legislation yes but uh, they have been still remain invisible voiceless and uh, uh, their work is not considered uh, valid like uh, milking a cow a woman is milking the cow and uh, she is uh, uh, her milk goes to the market get into packets goes to the market and uh, that is uh, that is added to the gdp the product goes to the market that is added to the national income but that woman who is milking the cow is invisible is unrecorded and therefore unrecognized so this is such a big gap and uh, and, uh, and and the only way uh, that we have found is to of course sangathan to come together on the basis of work and every work is uh, uh, worthful and that has to be recognized in several ways one is organized and then second is full employment at the household level not at the national level so uh, full employment uh, through work uh, your income and social security uh, and of course recognition so there is so much injustice official and unofficial so slightly improving they are becoming visible so that is uh, uh, everywhere so why should there be then difference between citizens uh, amongst the city also why should there be difference so the the only thing i think the only value that is most most important today and that comes to inside not by any outside and that is uh, jp the parai jane god has given conscience to everybody but where is the time to look into your own conscience there is so much of uh, of, of of bombardment from the outside that uh, you don't have a have scope or time in your mugaj to ke andar jhaanko kuch wait and uh, then listen to your conscience so everybody has that conscience to uh, to experience jo peed up or i got others others problems and if we just think uh, learn to think then seriously that uh, uh, there is an impact of whatever i do the impact is good or bad that impact is on me the uh, the impact on the on the community on the village people and uh, then impact on the on the environment on the on the mother earth but think correlative and if we think that we will find the answer to go ahead uh, from your own own then from from your own conscious 
and that I call thinking correlatedly in Anubandha. So then you, then if you think, if we think, uh, then whatever we do becomes responsible, meaningful, and nurturing, and not destructive. Uh, the strategy that we have uh, followed, and then I have put it into words, is that uh, an approach of 100 miles. Same thing, decentralizing. So, uh, in effect, cut down the distance between consumer and the producer. Cut down the distance between producer and consumer. Cut down the distance between uh, uh, producer and raw material. And cut down the, dis the distance between uh, uh, those who decide and those who have to follow. So if we cut down this distance, and, and it's a notional uh, idea of 100 miles, but that, you know, locally, when you go out in the morning and be able to come home and have your supper with your family and sleep in your own bed. So that is 100 miles. So if, if, we, can, if we can have our strategy working like that, I think uh, that we can do it. Out of my humble experience, I say that it is possible and uh, that is, uh, that is unbelievable. Thank you, Ilaben. Thank you so very much. Um, Ram, there are, you know, um, there are various questions for you, broadly in two areas. One about this large misconception, partly fueled by Gandhi himself, because I mean, he was the master at creating uh, misinformation about himself. Uh, one of them has to do with this uh, industrialization and, and, and what relationship does he have with the modern world and where do we then find the city in it. That was one. Second was a very specific one about Petri Geddes and, and the introduction that Mumford wrote to Patris uh, Geddes's work on India uh, and the differences that he pointed out of divergences between Gandhi and Geddes. So, so that's the second. Uh, and third, which is something that you need to answer uh, for yourself and for me as well, is that you know you you keep saying that I am a Gandhi scholar and not a Gandhian, and how do you really make a distinction between the two? And 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 uh, um, so there you uh, you will speak for all of us. So uh, um, so thank you, Ram. So your first question about Gandhi's broader economic or uh, you know. Uh, economic development philosophy. Sudita, Sudita you know, uh, uh, absolutely was quoting Gandhi correctly. I mean, one or two words may be slightly here and there, and she got the later little, little wrong, which I'll come to. Uh, broadly, she, she was absolutely right. She brought together two quotes of Gandhi, which I'm also quoting from memory for a few words may be wrong. One was to say uh, that, uh, you know, uh, which is 1928, December 1928, where he said, God forbid that India take to industrialization after the manner of the West. Uh, the economic imperialism of a single tiny island kingdom is today, namely 1928, keeping the world in chains. If a country of 300 million, which is what we were there now, was to take to similar economic exploitation, it will strip the world bare like locusts. All right. The other quote, uh, which is a little later, which is also uh, alluded to by Sunita, is about where he says, uh, you know, uh, what will be the fate of India trying to industrialize the West, uh, ape the West? You know, uh, and then he says, uh, the kind of something like, uh, you know, what are the worlds we have to conquer? I mean, look at what USA and in, uh, England has done. So he's brought one last thing, and then I'll come to the broader, you know, a technical, factual point. Hill Swaraj is irrelevant to environmentalist period. It's a fetishized over, uh, you know, uh, I mean, did he, I'm saying this to the world's greatest scholar on Hind Swaraj, who's that fantastic English <laughs> yes, edition. Thank you, Ram. Thank you. <laughs> but, but if you want to understand the mature Gandhi, look at what he writes after he comes back to India and travels around. He's writing in the 20s and 30s. Hind Swaraj is great 
for a defense, moral defense of non-violence and a moral defense of Hindu-Muslim harmony. Those are the two great attributes of Hind Swaraj. But development, modernization, westernization, environment, leave Hind Swaraj and look elsewhere. At his scattered periodical writing speeches of 20s and 30s, there is, it's there that he has, you could say, a broader environmental philosophy uh, which involves the issues that Kartikeya, Sunita, Ilaben have talked about, restraint, responsibility, decentralization, trusteeship, and you can certainly tease out a broader environmental and social philosophy from Gandhi's writings uh, from the 20s and 30s, particularly, which also is maturing. You know, uh, you know, all of us like our identity. So Gandhi tells uh, Nehru in 1945, I won't sing the, change a single word in Hind Swaraj, but he changes a hell of a lot in the way he's thinking. He's evolving all the time. This is true of his ideas on race and caste. He was a racist in his 20s. He was a principal anti-racist in his 40s and 50s. His caste, so even his ideas of economic growth and development are evolving. But broadly, there is a philosophy of restraint, responsibility, uh, decentralization, you know, uh, the last person and so on and so forth. And that is certainly absolutely relevant to all of us today. It's the philosophy that has inspired uh, people like Sujita Narayan, uh, like uh, people like Madhav Gadgil, people like Mera Patkar, Chandi Prasad, but you know, they've all taken what they wanted from Gandhi to become uh, modern 21st, uh, 20, modern India's most remarkable and pioneering environmentalists. Right. But on the city per se, with specific uh, detailed recommendations on how to manage cities, you know, the question of public transport, that uh, 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 air pollution, water conservation, water harvesting, you'll get nothing from Gandhi. On that, you would have to go to Patrick Geddes, someone like Patrick Geddes and other people like him, uh, who wrote this uh, series of town plans. By the way, uh, Pat Geddes knew Tagore too, and, uh, he's the, and he spent almost 10 years here traveling around. He was also a professor in Bombay for a bit. And, you know, slowly now, I think, I, I saw one of the people, K.T. Ravindran uh, is, is attending, people like K.T. Ravindran, A.G. Krishna Menon, are, are reviving Geddes' ideas. You know, his indoor plan, which is his biggest plan, has been republished. And he really deserves careful critical study because he is, you know, just as you have, uh, shall we say, people like uh, Salim Ali and M. Krishnan who wrote about the wild, people like J.C. Kumarapa who wrote about sustainable agriculture. You know, Geddes is really a very important Indian environmental pioneer. Mumford only knew him in his Scottish and American context. He didn't really know the depth of his Indian work. And I think we need some serious scholarship. In my essay in India Forum, uh, it's just a beginning, you know, it's called Making Indian Cities Habitable. Now, one, one thing I'd like to say, because there was a comment before I come to your last question about Gandhi and Gandhian. There was a, uh, you know, um, one of the comments about capitalism, that uh, there was uh, someone called Neha Sarvate who said, no one is speaking about capitalism. Now, I'd like to address, it's an important question. The question, but the, but, but the answer is, should we speak, is capitalism, uh, the elephant in the room, which we're not mentioning it, it, or is it resource intensive, capital intensive industrialism? I mean, if you look at the socialist world, Beijing just recently had worse air pollution than Delhi. I mean, the cities of Eastern Europe are an absolute disaster, absolute disaster. Worse than the cities, the Eastern Europe, the cities were much worse. Uh, the toxic contamination soil, the countryside was much worse than in capitalist Western Europe. So I think it's to do, capitalism is not really the issue. You know, it's really, and of course you can, you can have humane forms of capitalism. And uh, Western Europe uh, took the lead in climate change. The Americans were pushing back with Western Europe, Scandinavia. So I think it's, it's to do with technology, resource consumption, rather, I mean, capitalism is, is destructive, but it's really industrialism per se on the Western model, which Russia adopted wholeheartedly. You know, Lenin was a great admirer of American capitalism and wanted to take all its, you know, polluting methods to his own country. So the last question about, you know, Gandhi and Gandhian, you know, I think, uh, uh, you know, I mean, if I may tell a personal story about Tridip, I can tell a personal story about Tridip. I can. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so Tridip, as you know, was for several years um, a director of archives and the curator of the Samda, uh, Sabarmati Ashram, where he did the wonderful work, uh, he and Kinderi Band did the wonderful work that uh, Kartikeya alluded to, the Gandhi Heritage Portal. Now, if you go to the ashram, if you're coming from the city, uh, the ashram is on the right. Tiri's office was on the left. 
No, his office was on the right. He had another room on the left where he had his books. Why did the Gujaratis have to be on the right side, Ram? <laughs> what? We are a right-handed people, so we need to be on the right. <laughs> so, across the road, away from the ashram, was land that belonged to the ashram, but was not the ashram when Gandhiji first took it. I think, you know, why I don't call myself a Gandhian uh, is, of course, because there's a distinction between a scholar and an activist. You know, Tidip and me are on one side, and Ilaben and Sudita on the other side, and we shouldn't claim to be, you know, so that's, that's one thing. But more importantly, I think it's, one should never mortgage one's mind to a single person. Karl Marx famously said, I am not a Marxist. If Ambedkar were alive, he would say, I'm not an Ambedkarite. I don't know what Gandhi would say, but I believe Gandhi, Ambedkar, Kamla Devi Chattopadhyay, Jyotibai Pule, Rabindranath Tagore, you know, uh, E.V. Ramaswamy, I mean, there'll be people in Gujarat, all are extraordinary. We have a large and capacious heritage, Patrick Geddes, not just Indians, foreigners also, who can contribute. So I think even in an intellectual and philosophical sense, you constrain yourself by saying I'm a Gandhian. You can say, well, I'm a Gandhi, you know. Uh, and I think a lot, I mean, Ila Ben is, is actually an exception, you know, and she's an exception because who she is, uh, because of, she's in Ahmedabad. I mean, if you see the kind of, uh, the, the kind of, you know, Chati Prasad Bhatt is also a different kind of exception. You know, they, they, they evolved their own path away from the fetishization and the kind of, uh, of the Sarvodaya movement. So I think that's the reason I say that I'm not a Gandhian. Not just because, uh, you know, I may like a occasional drink. And, uh, but it's more that, you know, one should, it constrains you philosophically and ideologically. I think Ambedkar, I mean, one of the nicest things, one of the last things I say, one of the nicest things of the peaceful, non-violent protest for Hindu-Muslim harmony in the last month of 2019, in which I was proud and privileged to participate in, uh, in Ahmedabad and in Bangalore, were that the protesters, especially young protesters, spontaneously held up portraits of Gandhi and Ambedkar both. Thank you. Thank you, Ram. Sunita, if I could come to you um, broadly. Um, the, I mean, I think, um, what, you know, one area that we've, um, not really touched upon, although you did speak about it, and so did Kartike uh, and, and, and Kirti in his opening remarks, but there are questions uh, uh, and concerns around, are, is the large, broad rubric that we call planning, I mean, uh, and the processes of planning. And, and the idea is that what is it that we can do uh, in the way we think of planning we, the way we conceptualize plan, the way we execute plans for cities and for our um, metropolises uh, that could give us a chance to both rethink the cities or parts therein, as, as Kartike uh, spoke of self-governing smaller units within the city which are easy to think of and, and uh, ungovern. You'll have to unmute yourself, Sunita, sorry. Uh, I was saying, Sridev, forgive me. I mean, you work in the School of Planning and Architecture, but I would simply say that we are beyond... Interloper everywhere, as we you know. <laughs> beyond planning now, Sridev, okay? And I think the problem with the urban form and the urban thinking has been, we have been straight-jacketed thinking that we can actually plan for it. I mean, when I think about what I'm dealing with today, I mean, when I, I started looking at, I mean, we, we, I work on river pollution. And the fact is, when you look at river pollution and you go back and do your shit flow diagrams, you find out that, you know, there's such a complete mismatch between what we thought was the amount of official sewage which was entering our rivers because that's what was planned for, that you had these houses which were connected to underground sewerage, which was connected then to the river, to a treatment plant, cleaned up and taken to the river. Whereas the bulk of the city today is in what you would call an informal uh, shit management system. It's a self-managed shit system. And that's something that we have to understand that you know, the, the difference between what we are officially planning for and the scale of what is unplanned. And therefore, we have to start thinking about, can we actually plan for the unplanned 
or should we be redesigning our tools and thinking of planning? I mean, it's the same thing. I mean, we started working on air pollution. We were just looking at the backside of cars. Then you start understanding what mobility is about. As you understand mobility, you understand just the scale of the number of people who do not, who are still working in the, you know, in the invisible sector as far as uh, mobility is concerned. And yet all our cities are planned in a way that, you know, you take as much road space, you take away the pedestrian space, you make sure that, because you have thought about the visible. And I think the scale and the question I've, I mean, I am grappling with, and that's why we are looking at these very, you know, when we look at shit flow diagrams, for instance, and our fecal sludge management work, we are simply going back to government and saying, and to authorities and to everyone saying, stop planning. Start thinking about what exists today, collecting the shit of where it exists, taking it to a treatment plant, treating it, and actually reinventing the water-based system, which was extremely resource intensive. So I think in some senses, and this is a fascinating issue that should be discussed, is the limitation of planning in our countries. We can keep talking about and saying we need more capacity, we need to think more, we need to bring in. But I am asking a fundamental question. Are we really talking about its limitations, its inherent limitations, and we need to think about that, because otherwise our urban areas are going to become hated communities, which are actually the worst form of the village republic today. I mean, we talked about village republic at the beginning, and we talked about Gandhi talking about how these village republics may not be so ideal, but look at the village republics of modern urban India. They are exclusionary, they gated communities, they build, they make sure, and the COVID times, they made sure all the workers are kept out. And most of them haven't even been paid for their work, okay? And they make sure that they, their gates are closed, even ambulances cannot come in. And, you know, at the end of the day, we are now being pushed into what you would call this very, um, this model in which you'd say, oh, you know, get your energy from the roof and get your water from the groundwater and have your own guards and, you know, develop your own gated communities. Those are the ideal worlds. But just think how inequitable our cities will become and are because of that. Unless we redesign the public and unless we think about, as I keep saying, you think about, that last person, I mean, today, I mean, when Ram knows this, Kartike knows this, Ila Ben knows this, I mean, you know, when I started with my environmental work, I was, you know, it was Anil who I learned from, and he used to talk a lot about this. But I think of the relevance of Anil today and the relevance of Gandhi today, it's completely, it's, it's a different field. I mean, I, I, it, 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 I don't think they'd ever have thought about plastic management and the relevance of Gandhi today. And not just in terms of frugality and minimization, but actually in terms of how you're going to ever manage that plastic. So I think those are the areas where in, in some senses we'll need to come back. But I think the limits to planning and not in my backyard becoming uh, led by the rich, creating exclusionary gated communities is even worse than the village republics that Gandhi did. Thank you, Sunita. Kartik, you made um, three sets of concerns. Um, you worked on all of those. Um, 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 one was actually meant for Sunita, but I, I kept it for you. Um, uh, it's got to do with this idea of the smart city and, and, and you know, where are we going with that notion and what could we do to, to rethink some of the assumptions of that. Second is about something that you've been very passionate about and um, is about cycling and, and something that both of us share. Uh, and, and uh, you know, the work that CE did in Pune and in um, what, what you proposed uh, for Ahmedabad, it be certain zones uh, about cycling and can that really solve the problem. And third is what kind of institutional structures do we need to imagine to really look at uh, what we've been proposing or thinking? 
uh, because each one of uh, you articulated a certain problem and spoke of a solution, uh, is it possible to think in terms of an institutional structure for it? So these are three broad things. And uh, with that, I think uh, we would have covered largely uh, the broad spectrum of concerns and questions. Thank you. Thank you, Tridip. And um, I'll just start with just that question you asked Sunita about planning. Uh, and I think uh, planning as an enabler rather than planning as superimposing their will on people is a very different way of planning. I think the example which Ilab had mentioned and Kirti has always spoken about, which is that a slum is a solution and not a problem. Now, if you, if you see what people are doing and you build it in, and assist them in what they're doing, there is a very different type of planning than a planning which it's sitting in your office and you, you have this grandiose idea, but you don't look at people. So that was just one comment I thought I will, I'll make before. I think the smart city and, and where we are heading has a, a lot of potential to achieve much of what we do. But the fear which Sunita said that what COVID has really demonstrated is that the rich who can afford it are now even moving out of the city. The, the demand for outer, because they know that they can, if they have a good computer connection, they need to come into the city only rarely, and they can live in a gated, as she said, community, and, 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 be, and just leave everyone uh, to the city and whatever else it is. And I think this is a, is a real fear today, that the divide between the rich and the poor, instead of narrowing, which it can in a smart city, is going to broaden. And, and if you really play it well, if you, if you do it right, it's, a, it's not a talk for just like a minute here, but I think if the maybe a separate meeting on smart cities and, uh, 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 and, uh, and the informal sector and equity and various other things does need to be looked at. We've got uh, work going on in it, but it is to my mind, there are many options which, which are there. Uh, Vikram Sarabhai, when he was talking about television, going into the remotest villages was talking about something of bridging a gap because it would take education. Today, when children are asked to work from home on, on things and the children don't have a, a, a mobile phone, or if there's only one at home, the boy gets it and the girl child doesn't, it, it is an absolutely terrible situation. You, you, every now and then you also hear of, a, of someone committing a suicide because they felt too ashamed to tell people that they didn't have a, have a phone connection or a mobile smartphone. So I think like all, all new technologies, they are both enablers and, and can go the other way. And I think if we are smart, I think it's maybe the smart city needs smart, smart people or smart planners to really execute what a smart city is. Cycling, uh, I should say that Tridip is an extraordinary cycler. And, and, and does, does this huge round of Damdabad, the uh, outer ring road and whatnot. Um, but the, we are doing it as an option. We are doing it as a recreational thing, to some extent, or as an exercise thing. But if you really have to cycle, the roads are really bad. Now, the planning of the roads, for instance, just the cycling path on the riverfront, is nicely defined with cobbled stones, just built over bridges. But I think we must first decrease the amount of need for traveling. And as I said, you, it's possible if you can have more locally available things. So I, I really feel that that having these these uh, these cities within cities or villages within cities, uh, without the the negativities of, of certain villages which are exclusively would be very good. Now we do need to have institutional mechanisms, and I think this is where Gandhi excelled in the Majur Margin at that stage, that that he not only solved the problem but created an institutional mechanism with it. Now the, now, the ward level mechanism is important. I think, for instance, Eleven will tell you that there is already a uh, parliament legislation which says how that a street or a road is not only meant for vehicles, it is also equally meant for the informal sector, but the way that will be organized will be decided by the local group, the neighborhood group, the neighborhood mechanism. Now, that mechanism has not really been created. This is, this is at least 10 years old. So when that legislation was passed, we were all rejoicing. So finally, we have got a mechanism 
you've got a law without a mechanism being created. I think you need a mechanism at the local level. Now, at that local level, if you're too small, you will have people excluding some communities. If you're too large, people won't feel involved. So finding that right size, which has the urban qualities, but, but does not have the prejudices of a rural area, is, I think, where, where we need to go. And create an institution there with certain powers so that they can take certain types of decisions within that area about water, about public facilities, about bus stands, about various other things. You drop a list, just like you have a central and a state list, you should have a municipal list for the state for the city, but you should also have a list for the local area, which it can really do it, and, and, and democracy will work perhaps much better at a much more local area. I should finally end by saying that I've not spoken about education and youth and students, which is what I do most of my work in, and I think involving young people at that local level, involving schools at that local level, schools taking the responsibility, they are much more idealistic, they are not part of some of these uh, this baggage of thinking. They are futuristic in thinking. And I think if we form a body where with young people at the local level for the type of change, uh, and I think if they understand Gandhi truly, I think it will be great. Thank you. Karthike, by um, Kirti, do you want to come back to... Um, um, to yeah. To... Can, can I? Can I? Sure, please. Uh, Pradip, I think... Uh... Uh, I, I, I just wanted to take a few minutes, you know, even though I'm not a panelist, you know, there are a few things that I would like to kind of come back on. You know, I think this very interesting observation that uh, Ila Ben made <clears throat> about rethinking cities, and she's the one who I have grown up, you know, looking at as my mentor for the last 50, 55 years. And I do understand in what context he's saying this. Not because we are running this webinar, 30 webinars or rethinking cities, but there's a very strong argument why we need to rethink our cities. In fact, I believe that if there is no need to rethink our cities, there's nothing to rethink about in this country. And let me kind of tell you why I'm saying this. We have three capital cities in this country where well, Delhi is the political capital of this country. And we know what, what a political capital means. Its air is so polluted that High Court said it's a gas chamber. It was a deliberate phrase. It was a gas chamber. Mumbai is the wealth capital of this country. The richest people leave that business industry, leave there. The graph of people living in slums in Mumbai is taller than the graph of people living in ordinary houses. We have Varanasi as the, as the religious, as the, as the spiritual capital of the country. And Ganga requires a special ministry to clean it up. It's a huge statement on how we have managed our cities. If this is what we have done to our capital cities, our political capital, our, our, our wealth capital, our religious capital, it only shows what we have done to our cities otherwise. Let me mention something that Kartike may remember. This was a long time ago. This was an inauguration of NID. And there was a conference called Design for Development. And Ramesh Thapar was the keynote speaker. And he made absolutely incredible observation. He said, waves of vulgarity are invading our cities. I'm talking about something he said 40 years ago. Waves of vulgarity are invading our cities. And he says, I don't know what is the task of a sensitive designer. That if you're a good architect, is to put one sensitive building among 99 ugly or to work to sensitize society which doesn't produce 99 ugly buildings. And I really want to take that ugliness a little further. What is the ugliness? That 5% of car holders occupying 90% of the road space is 
wave of vulgarity. Ambani building a billion dollar house just 400 kilometers, 400 meters from Bombay, middle of the Bombay, away from a festering slum is a vulgarity. In 2020, in the COVID time, to find out that in slums of Mumbai and other places, 30 people share a water tap and 40 people share a toilet is a vulgarity. And we've got to be very, very sensitive about this. And this must change. We don't have time to change for that. Let me kind of give two small little examples of which I am being partner. Ram, you will be interested, but I'm an architect and design a house for a friend of mine in Bangalore. You probably know her, Anita Reddy. When I designed that house 20 years ago, there were no provision of fan. I come from Ahmedabad and therefore understand you've got to provide fan. In this house, in that house today, you require not less than 12 air conditioning working all the time. This is what we've done to our macro climate, to our cities. And many years ago, and I'm still very proud of it, I designed a township in Ahmedabad for the slum dwellers, 50% Hindus, 50% Muslims, and we designed a system where Hindus and Muslims decided to live together, to share their toilet, to share their courtyard, to share their backyard. In this community, there is not a single Hindu in a community of 16,000 people. This is how our cities have changed. And if we really want, want, want something to happen, something want to come about, we've got to rethink our cities completely in our planning, in the way we look at them, where we design them, when we manage them, where we structure them, and where we finance them. So what I'm trying to say is this, in search for better cities, in search for inclusive cities, search for people caring cities, poor sensitive cities, and sustainable cities, we need to rethink our growth trajectory. And we've got to rethink our development model. As Sunita very beautifully said, that if this is the way we continue living, if this is the way we continue producing, if this is the way we continue transacting, this is the way we continue consuming, and this is the way we want to be prosper and achieve, that model is unlikely to work. And therefore, there's a great need to rethink model we've got to kind of bring back Gandhi in its, in its total context. Having said that, let me thank once again my responsibility to the Bhai for a very thoughtful, very dignified, very rich in content webinar. And I, I, I behaved myself, that's all I did. <laughs> <laughs> you were very efficient in speaking less. Uh, I'm very grateful to the distinguished panel, includes Ilaben, uh, Ram Guha, uh, Sunita, and Kartikya. Thank you very much for for enlightened discussion and this uh, this wonderful wonderful meeting. Uh, as Tridip uh, will remember, I think when I started talking about this, I said I was very keen on three webinars, and I was discouraged not to do it. I don't think I'm going to listen to you. I'm going to continue exploring possibilities and have two more webinars on Gandhi and cities if possible. Uh, let me kind of end by saying that, you know, uh, the web next webinar takes place on 6th of October. It will be at 4.30. It's part of the four-part sub-theme on urban mobility. And we're looking at BRPS this time. We're saying, our, what, is the, what is the unfinished agenda so far BRTS is concerned? And that will be anchored by Dr. Abhijit Lokhre. They're all kindly invited to attend. And let me end this meeting by thanking my colleagues at uh, the studio in half. They have been uh, very hardworking. They have made each webinar remarkable for its uh, 
it's, it's, it's efficiency, they've been proactive, they've been cooperative, and they've been helpful in every respect. And therefore, I'm thankful to Hari Haran, to Radhika, to Shivani, to Nikki, to Shimul, to, to Elika, and to Nita, uh, to Nita for making this uh, a wonderful, wonderful event. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you very much for your time. I was telling Radhika, this may not last more than 90 minutes. We already done more than two hours. And it's, uh, it's been tremendous in terms of what, is, what, has, what has been said and what we have learned. Thank you very much. I want to say something, may I? Nila Ben, please. This I have written down. Address to Kirti Bai. Kirti Bai, each of your webinars open up a follow up worth a whole department of a university. You have, as if, established a virtual university of thinking cities. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, sir. Thank you, Sunita. Thank you, Tridip. Thank you, Ilaban. Thank you, Ram Saab. Thank Ram you. Saab, I'm going to talk to you. I think I want to get you on the second webinar on Gandhi. Sure, sure. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you, Kartikeya. Thank you, Tridip. Thank you, I think, you know, Anamik sir. So thank you very much for, for all you. the cooperation and help. Very, very, I'm very enlightened. Terrific discussion today.